Hi, everyone. I want to mention that we're recording this session. So if you need to drop out, you can catch up by finding the entire Zoom session on the club's new YouTube channel. If everyone could mute themselves at this point, we'll open it up for comments and we will be checking chat if you have any questions or comments. So we'd like to kind of manage the Zoom that way. So welcome to the Cedar version of Weeders and Readers. I can appreciate, we're all suffering from Zoom fatigue. So thanks for attending. It's so great to see your faces and it will be so great to see the first crocus come up in 36 days over here in <laughs> East Belfast, can't wait. So I just wanna spend a second bragging about the collection of horticultural books the club has donated to the library on the pre-recorded Zoom that Astrid and I did last month, I mentioned that I did a search on the word garden in the main Minerva system and looked at a couple um, libraries. I think I did Blue Hill, Camden, and Kenny Bunkport. And I have to say, it was just amazing how much larger and better our um, library is. And I, I mentioned at that time that I had found three books through that search in Belfast that I wanted to, um, to take out. And I just wanted to share them with you um, this morning. So this book is Designing and Planting a Woodland Garden. And um, the author explains how to combine plants that thrive together and how to create shade, even if you don't have it. He started his garden slate and just made it into a shade garden. So that's what I'm reading right now. And uh, it's been very fun. Mary, who's the author of that? All right, Keith Wiley, right. Thanks, thanks, Astrid. Oh Keith. yeah, yeah, yes. I, I'm not that He's familiar. a very well-known uh, nurseryman in England. He's a really no, well-known nurseryman in England. So do you think that this really, book might really be good grower? I didn't get the feeling that um, um, said unusual plants, but I didn't get the feeling that it was British. Do you think it is? No, I think it is um, designed for the American market and probably the zone, the zone information and stuff is pertinent to the United States because they track their zones differently in the yeah. United Kingdom. Yeah. Um, and actually that would be a good companion to a visit to Fernwood Nursery because probably oh, a lot of the things he talks about in there you can right. find it yeah, I'm sorry I missed that one last night. So this, I must be the last person in Belfast to read this book, I think. This is um, Reeser Manley and Marjorie Parento's book, Life in the Garden. And this was a, also a donation from the club. And Astrid and I were talking about cilantro yesterday and there's like a two page fold out on why you wanna plant cilantro everywhere. So I thought, that was kind of fun. The book also um, has great graphics. The page, the, the verbiage is broken up by all sorts of fun pictures to look at. So yeah, I, was, I always wanted to read that and um, I'm glad I got that one out. And then I think Astrid would really like this book. So this is From Art to Landscape, Unleashing Creativity in Garden Design. And I'll just read what the, um, but the inside says, in this book, the landscape architect Gary Smith explores the various means that artists use, including drawing, painting, sculpture, meditation, poetry, and dance to create personal connections with the landscape. Throughout the book, the author's friendly and encouraging voice removes the shroud of mystery surrounding the creative process and shows how even the least artistically inclined can tap into their inner resources. So I have found at Open Gardens that my favorite gardens are the ones where the gardener is also an artist or has artistic tendencies. So I'm looking forward to reading this to learn more about how they are visual. I think I can be taught that by reading this book. So those are the three books I found just by typing in the word garden. And um, they won't be back in the system for about two months when I get to them. So just <laughs> write yourself a note in May to go to the library and look because uh, you probably won't be back until then. 
So um, I, the first book that we're going to talk about that was a 2020 donation is Scraps, Wilt, and Weeds, Turning Wasted Food into Plenty by Mads Reslin. And I wanted to, to make this be my book because I love repurposing thing. And I didn't realize that I could repurpose my um, compost. So it's a new topic to me, food waste. And I just want to spend a second talking about food waste because it's a new something new to me. And, and maybe you're not familiar with all these horrendous statistics about food waste. So even in this age of food insecurity, we throw out a pound of food per day per person, according to the USDA. And that equals eight, 81 billion pounds of food waste globally and about $1,400 per family. And as that food rots in the landfill, I didn't realize this, but it emits uh, methane, which is 36 times more potent than the carbon that comes out of your car. So that was just incredible to me. And I was wondering, how does all this waste happen? Well, I did some research on the internet. And one of the things is unrealistic aesthetic food standards, the thought that's cosmetically perfect food tastes better. And I wish I knew how that came to be. I think as we become more distant from our farms and where we get our food, we just think that that's the way food should be. And we just dismiss anything that isn't perfect. Another contributor to food waste is supersizing the American idea that bigger is better, increase portion sizes in schools, larger plates and portions in restaurants, and also in the home leads to over purchasing and overeating. And if the food isn't eating, eaten, it gets thrown away. So more food is thrown out because it's gone bad. But in the book, it talks about what is bad, even though it's wilted, it still has some nutritional value. And you can turn parsley if it's wilted into pesto. Actually, almost anything can be turned into pesto. But there's a recipe in the book for making pesto with celery leaves, which I usually compost. And um, another thing that I do is um, when I'm making a smoothie, I throw in the strawberries, the whole strawberry. I don't hull them out. And the blender just takes that hull and it's, it's all good. So. Um, it really makes you rethink what is going into your um, compost. Another reason for food waste, apparently, is larger refrigerators. And who doesn't know that the forgotten food gets pushed to the back? And I attended a UMaine Zoom yesterday on food waste, and they said to assign a certain area of your refrigerator for leftovers, so you know that that's your go-to, that's what's gotta be eaten first or, or next. And I thought that was a good tip, but I'm gonna try to carve out a space in my refrigerator so I can do that. So I've included a resource, um, a TED lecture on global food waste in um, your packet that I'm gonna email to you. But now I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about the book. So Scraps, Wilts and Weeds, helps you envision what can be done with the leftover section of your refrigerator. It's a recipe book organized by major food groups, fruits, grains, meat, seafood, vegetables, and uses the various techniques of cooking, fermenting, dehydrating, brining, pickling, and freezing to transform these table scraps into something usable. Some recipes require you to freeze your scraps until you have enough to make a recipe. Other recipes, you might want to freeze the scrap until the right occasion appears, like the cauliflower core is served with a brie recipe. So you might not have the you know company coming over. So you put that in the freezer. So I do feel that the um, recipes in the book does require a, a large amount of freezer space that is well organized. Some recipes in the book like apple cider vinegar 
are used in subsequent recipes. And that's always nice that you make it once, use it many times. And um, most of the scraps he talks about, like coffee grounds, have several recipes to choose from. So if that one, like one is putting coffee grounds in ice cream, if that, if you're not eating ice cream right now because you put on the pounds, then there's other things you can do with the coffee grounds. The last chapter is on foraging the forest using spruce, pine, and fir in recipes. So for me, that's good to know in case I got lost hiking, but I think I'll stick to eating my compost right now. So there'll be lots of recipes in your um, resource book uh, pamphlet that I'll mail out. And so check this book out. I think that you'll really um, enjoy it. So are there any questions on food waste or the recipes in the book? Yeah, or comments. I mean, I, I would like to hear if anyone uses something unusual or cooks with something unusual or sort of has this approach in their own kitchen right now. I'm kind of curious what other people do. I mean, to, to my mind, this was uh, connected to the slow food movement a little bit and um, nose to tail cooking, which is sort of how, you know, maybe uh, a few generations ago, everything was utilized. Everything was utilized. I actually have a beef tongue in my refrigerator right now, and I'm really looking forward to trying that. I've never cooked tongue, but this year we bought half a beef, and so we got a tongue. So I'm going to figure it out. Anyone else want to comment? I, I will. Tongue's quite good, actually. My aunt used to make it when I was young, and it, it's kind of like a corned beef. I think she boiled the heck out of it with some vinegar and whatnot. But speaking of the Yeah, it's a long simmering, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But it's good. It's tasty. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Like, yeah. The, the pine tree recipes, the spruce. If you look at the cookbook that Nancy Perkins circulated last week, Liz Stanley had given us a recipe for using um, one of the spruces in oh, cookies. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so check your cookbooks too. <laughs> I always, I always throw celery leaves in with my um, broth for chicken broth. They're very flavorful. I, I like to chew on them. They're tasty. So I've always used celery. You know, I've made uh, the pesto with the, my carrot tops. It is very fresh tasting and very good. I've enjoyed that. And yeah. Mary, I wanted to ask you, uh, if you're saving like the uh, core of the cauliflower and broccoli mm -hmm. and all, do you have to parboil that stuff before you throw it in the freezer? Is that a question or a comment? It is a question. question. I don't know. You'll have to get the book out of the library. Oh. <laughs> Very good. I doubt it, Marianne. I actually bet you don't have to. Okay, I will experiment. That's great. Yeah. I just wonder if perhaps the uh, cores will get um, soggy when you take them out of the freezer, you think? Yeah, so it, I, I mean, I'm not quite sure what recipe that was in the book that, um, that calls for that. So depending on then what you're going to do with it later, it might matter or not matter if it gets soggy, right? I mean, okay. if you're turning it into a puree, for example, okay. maybe it's okay, you know, maybe it's all right that it does. Well, that's great. Thank you. I, I really like broccoli stems. So Actually, broccoli stems are my favorite part of the broccoli. So I just peel them and eat them. I think they're absolutely delicious. And often that's a part that just gets thrown in the compost. It's a people. lot. It's a lot of waste. Yeah. 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 And I find I love the texture of it. It's sort of like jicama or something. It is. Um, yeah. yeah. Really tasty. Bro broccoli stems are good in a stir fry. Oh, oh right. Totally. Yes, definitely. It's sliced in circles. Yeah. Yeah, and I just, I prefer that texture over the weird little grainy, flowery, broccoli head texture. I think, I think a lot of, I've read that colleges are taking leftover food that they have in their cafeteria and packaging it, freezing it, and giving it away to food pantries and such. So I think there is some, there is some, um, there are some people doing some things. I have one of the green cones, so when I do have um, compost, I put it in the green cone that we did a few years, we bought them a few years ago and um, things yeah. disappear. So I, I feel good. I'm not throwing it in the garbage, in the trash. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think uh, something that is mentioned in the book quite often is um, uh, the issue of how much food get wa gets wasted before it even makes it to the grocery store. Right. So there are a lot of, I mean, even in Waldo County, we have a, we have a, a gleaning group right. that right. Um, goes to fields and after the mechanical harvesting picks up, picks by hand things like blueberry fields and things. So I think there's a lot of ways to capture food in the food stream and then also figure out how to um, either eat it or like you're doing Marge, composting it. I have a worm bin at my house and that's yeah, how I, I compost. Yeah, and I think somebody in the chat all is who's in the who mentioned in the chat? Oh, yes, Monroe. Monroe. <laughs> Hi, novice gardener to the area, just starting worm composting, waiting for worms. May need scraps someday. <laughs> yes, I agree. Sometimes it's actually a little tricky. Once in a while, I just decide to make homemade applesauce because I need to feed my worms the apple peels. <laughs> Um, cause it's hard. It's sometimes hard to keep them fed when it's just, it's just my husband and me, but I bet you'll, if you reach out to friends, they'll, they'll give you, they'll give you scraps. And if you need any help, uh, comp uh, like if you have questions about worm composting, you can actually get in touch with me. I'll put my email in the, in the chat. Oh, somebody asked, what is the green cone? That was what was sold, um, a few years ago. They're, they're, they're designed in Canada, we got a price on them and um, you have to bury them partly in the soil and then it's, it's insulated. So it gets heat, gets warm in winter and the food just disappears. You don't use the compost. Um, who's um, I'm trying to think who's, who was, who was it who got those for us? Oh, I can't think of her name right now. And what's the difference in the result of that versus a compost pile? You don't take the food, the waste out. It just it goes into the ground and um, just is. You can put anything oh, in see. it, any food in it. You don't put leaves and grass in it, but mm -hmm. food, food for food waste. Marge, that was Sharon Grogan. Okay, yes, Sharon Grogan, and she worked with somebody in our club too. Yes, right. Thanks, Mary. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, worm composting is something that I think I want to get into. So Astrid, you're already doing that. I can hit you up later, I guess, to like sure. the ins and outs. Yeah, my my um, worms right now need a little bit of room, the poor things. I have to actually harvest, harvest their poop. It's getting full. So I don't want to go too much, but how do you know the worms are hungry? Like, how does Marge know that it, or whoever Mench Chris mentioned, how do you know that you, they're in danger? Well, um, I, I see. so this is, this is a longer conversation. Yeah, yeah. But worms are actually, um, worms are not vegetarians. So the worms are not actually eating the scraps that you put in there they're eating the bacteria that are on the scraps that are breaking the scraps down wow and so as the scraps disappear right the bacteria is gone the bacteria needs something to feed on and then the worms eat the bacteria so you 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 want to have both um food scraps and then like newspaper or newsprint um or the paper that you've kind of cut up and dampened and they use that as bedding and also bacteria start to break that down in the worms. They, you know. they have someone who teaches this at um, Meadows, Meadow Springs. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. if Camden, they jock the worm bin man or something. He comes and he brings the equipment and he brings the worms and you can start he, every so oh. often he's, he oh. does one. That's evening. great. I mean, maybe we should get him to come to the garden club. So I have been keeping worms in my house for a really, really long time. And um, I am not the best worm mommy, but I have kept <laughs> them alive. <laughs> um, and uh, I've learned a trick or two, but it would be maybe I, I, there's probably a lot of information on YouTube about worm keeping. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, let's get. And what happens yeah. is, yeah. We can we can talk about that some other time. But. 
So Ash is going to talk about the book that she picked. Make yeah, so, um, and this kind of, it's, it's interesting, right? Um, all, once you start to read all these gardening books, of, and they, they all come at this thing that we love in slightly different ways, but there's a lot of crossing over. Anyway, this book, Nikki Jabor's Veggie Garden Remix, is um, the little subtitle is 224 new plants to shake up your garden and add variety, flavor, and fun. So this is uh, Nikki Jabor is a very good writer about vegetable gardening. She lives in Canada and she gardens almost year round. There's another great book that Mary and I are talking about maybe getting this year that talks about season extension, which would be, it's really interesting. And she does it on a home scale, unlike like Elliot Coleman, like he, he has a book for season harvest, which is great, but it's, it's more geared toward commercial growers, although I've learned a lot from reading it. But Nikki Jabor has a home garden that she use, uses as her demonstration garden and how she, she builds her books off of her work in that garden. So it's got a real down to earth, she's a real down to earth person and, and she has a lot of knowledge through personal experience and she's very um, straightforward, direct, excited, inspirational. And I, I, I think this book is good for a beginner as well as a more advanced gardener. In particular, if you're feeling like you've just been growing the same group of vegetables for the last decade and you'd like to figure it out. And the way, the way that she does it is, uh, which I like. So for example, <laughs> she says, if you like, I'm just trying to find the, I should have marked it. If you like tomatoes, you might like to try garden berries. And then she introduces you to ground cherry, tomatillo and Cape gooseberry and how you would, um, why you might like them, um, where they come from, the details on how to start them. The, the pictures are really beautiful. Um, the cultivation requirements are straightforward. She gives you information about different varieties um, uh, just a shameless plug. I'm growing a lot of the things in this book from, I will have starts of them. So if you feel like you want to just try one and see if you like it, then buy seeds the next year. Um, however, for example, I really need to up my cucumber game because if you like your basic old cucumber, she's got a lot of suggestions for you. And each one is slightly different and maybe even is like this one would be good for a pickle or this one is really good in a salad or that you know there's a lot of different reasons to grow different different um varieties uh, one of the reasons is just um this idea of abundance and how different cultures have taken i mean basically every brassica known to man, and there's a bazillion of them, um, like dogs originated from one brassica, one little weed growing somewhere that someone decided to, you know, to taste. And so broccoli, kale, all of those things are related to one another at a very deep level. And they, and so human beings have been messing around with that particular little, little plant forever and ever to get all these different varieties. So they are, they are the dogs of the vegetable world. But um, there's a lot of new tomato varieties in here that were new to me. And she describes the different nuances. So it's not just lists of things and that, you know, it's more specific. And um, she's grown all of these things in her garden and she tells you how to grow them. So I, I really love that. And um, in the... Um, packet of information that Mary's going to email to you, I put together a, uh, a very extensive yet completely just scratching the surface list of smaller seed houses where you might find a lot of these varieties and also a lot of other unusual varieties 
and um, in particular things that are not hybrids that are open pollinated that you can save the seeds from yourself. So if you start like ground cherry, once you plant one, you only need to plant one ground cherry and then you just let it go to seed and you'll have ground cherries the rest of your life. And they're a great, they're a great plant. I'm, I don't think that's a problem. I actually love self seeders. Astrid, so I have a question. Yeah. So what is her, um, her overreaching concept? Is she just looking for, is it a taste thing? Like she is telling us about varieties that taste good or more like we're in zone five and that's where she is. So these are proven zone five, which I'm sure they are, but do you think that she has an overreaching concept of what she's um, talking about? Yes, I think that there, I think there are two things going on here. One is, I think the underlying theme is mm -hmm. discovering uh, world culture through growing different kinds of vegetables. Right, so we could say in that way, it's aligned with a catalog like Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, if you're familiar with that catalog. They travel the world lear learning about different kinds of watermelons or, uh, and, and where they were first grown and how they were grown and why they were grown. And they're interested in getting that seed into the hands of gardeners all over the place to, for a few reasons. One is um, to, um, to create redundancy and sustainability in the food system, um, to create control at a local level, to um, foster curiosity and camaraderie with the rest of the human beings around the globe that farm and to be uh, adventurous and curious about seed and vegetables and what we grow and what we eat and why we do it. So I would say that, cause I've heard her speak before. I would say that is a, that is an underlying goal. And then she wants people to be successful. So she is, using her own personal experience and not recommending things that she doesn't know anything about. So then, you know, also, I think there's a kind of confidence. Here's this person that lives in our zone, actually maybe a little bit colder, um, who grows these things and is enthusiastic about them. So I want to try them too, which is why I think it's such a great, it's because you can, you can come at her books from a bunch of different levels and a, be a beginning gardener can really get a lot out of a book like this, even though it seems like it's kind of specialty. Does that answer your question? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I had forgotten that she said that she was inspired by her mother-in-law that was from where, do you remember? No, Some I don't remember. Eastern European country. Right. Um, so you want to talk a little bit more about your seed houses um, smaller sure, maybe that's a good time to do it. So um, when, when Mary suggested that we put together a resource packet, I am, I am really interested in um, supporting a few things in the seed system. And this is a longer conversation and there's a lot of information in the, in the seed house list that I provided. If you are interested more in saving seed and trading seed and getting seed from other small gardeners. For example, if you don't know about it, um, the uh, United, uh, no, excuse me. Oh, Lord, where is it? I should have. <laughs> I should have marked this on the list. The uh, Seed Savers Exchange, thank you, Astrid. You're, I have like two brain cells. The Seed Savers Exchange is, um, you can buy seed from their catalog and when you do it supports their work, but they also have a network that you can belong to and you can directly 
ask for seed from another small grower in a, in a different part of the world. And you can also provide seed to people. So that particular organization and a lot of these organizations, actually a lot of these places were started in the 70s by wonderful people who were really worried about, um, what would we say, um, giving control of our seed and our food system to giant corporations like Monsanto, which was just recently bought by Bayer. So not only is uh, Bayer, so Bayer is now selling hybridized seed that um, is often genetically modified um, in order to uh, be utilized along with the um, fungicides and herbicides that it is also selling. Um, and I actually think it also makes and sells uh, machines for cancer treatment. So I, I just wanna say that, that that group of things all together under one umbrella makes me really concerned. So I, what, I, what I wanna do is I wanna support small seed houses and there are a lot of them and they're really interesting and they are labors of love for the most part. Um, and we have some, we have some in our state. We have some wonderful people. So the first page is the first page and a little bit of the second are actually seed houses in Maine. And of course, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Fedco and Johnny Selected Seeds. And um, the Fedco seed catalog has a lot of information about, <clears throat> about the seed bank, about the complexities of growing and disseminating seed and they are 100% transparent about the kind of seed houses that they buy. So there's little icons after every seed entry that tells you if it was a small grower, an organic grower, um, if it was a conventional, a conventional seed farm, and if it was a seed farm that uses genetically modified organisms. So totally transparent. They also support seed initiatives um, and donating seed to people that need it as do many of the uh, other seed houses that I've listed. Um, and then uh, we even right here in Belfast have an amazing little seed house called uh, Troy Howard Middle School. And they save their seed, they package it, they design the packages and it's for sale at the Belfast co-op while the supplies last. And they have really good information about their seed on their website. And I've, I've included links to all of that. So of course, when we can um, support smaller seed houses, they're doing really good work. They're doing really interesting work. And a lot of them specialize in, for example, one of the seed houses that I've listed here specializes in seeds from Ghana and the Ghanaian area of Africa. Really interesting. And a lot of the website sites are great and they have a lot of extra information on them. Many of them have, have uh, belonged to the Open Source Seed Initiative, which is a really interesting program that um, is basically saying, we want to share our seed work, share our seed development, and we want you to take our work and build upon it for free. We're not going to patent our work. And this is this is a wonderful a wonderful initiative, and it gets you to start thinking about how things happen and why they happen. And especially for me, I feel often like I have no control over anything. But I know that when I plant a plant in the ground, I am immediately starting to sequester carbon. And that makes me really happy. So if I can't do anything but that, and if I can convince other people to plant more plants, I feel like I'm doing something really good. And if I can say, save my seed and trade my seed and get more people to do that and get more people to connect with other people that are doing that, I feel like these kinds of grassroots efforts are things that I can, I can do about climate change right now. Okay. So Astrid, that's a lot of that. 
One of the books I got out of the library is the Seed Saver Exchange, um, The Art and Practice of Seed Saving. So I'll put this, if it's not already on our resource list, I'll put it on. This book is the Bible of seed saving. Now, maybe we'll talk about that more in the fall, but um, when I saw it, I just had to have it. It's just a, another gorgeous book. And um, if you are interested in saving your own seed, this is, this is the one book you wanna get. Yeah, so I, uh, in the fall, so some of you know, I, I own a small nursery. And in, the, in, in late summer and into the fall, I have a, a giant cardboard box filled with old paper bags of various sizes. And I am running around the garden, basically popping those over seed heads and cutting them off and like just throwing them in a closet because I don't have a lot of time to do anything more than that until the winter time. But it's not hard to save seed and it's pretty easy to understand when the time is right I would say germination, which is another thing we're gonna talk about, and especially if some fussy perennials is another matter, but um, saving seed is really fun. And once you start doing it, you will never look back. Just like growing from seed. If you haven't grown from seed, it's super fun. There's a lot of really easy plants that just want to germinate if you look at them. And it's, you, you can't help, but you just get completely addicted. So um, Astrid and I feel like we could talk about starting from seed for about two weeks. In fact, we've already talked to each other with each other for eight hours to put oh, this presentation easily. together. So I think we just want to get a feeling for um, what people would, how we want to spend the uh, remainder of our time. We came up with 10, actually nine, I consolidated one, nine steps for successful sewing. We can um, take the conversation in that way. I have some props here to show you that what I'm gonna be trying with winter sewing. Um, so what can we just take a reading? Um, do people want some tips? Do they have tips to offer about? What, how would you like to spend the rest of our time? Cause like we said, we could talk for two weeks about it. Yeah, does it, I mean, you can just chime in or if you have something you want to write in the chat about it. Okay, so I'm just going to start with our, our nine steps according to Mary and Astrid for successful uh, <laughs> seed starting. So Astrid said um, the number one for her was to read the package and um, just- Maybe the I, number one, Mary, is actually to plant the seed. To plant the seed? To oh. actually put the seed in the dirt. <laughs> right. So yes, I, I showed Astrid, I was going through my seed packages and I had a package that I had collected called Red Hollyhock 2011. So um, that's kind of unfortunate. I don't know if that's got any viability or not. Speaking of which, one of the things in your resource packet um, is a um, document that will tell you like lettuce last seven is fresh. You know, you can probably reuse lettuce seed for seven years, beans, maybe 10 years, I don't know. Um, and what is only good for one. So it may have hollyhocks or, or malva on it. And I'll know if I wasted that seed or not. But so I thought, well, first you have to read the, the catalog to see if you have what it takes to germinate that seed. I <laughs> made the mistake of, I'm gonna grow artichokes. And for about four years, I just kept putting that seed in and having limited success. I got an artichoke about that big one year, but that's because I never really read about what it takes to, um, to grow uh, an artichoke. So think about your, the time, like when you're ordering, I, do you really have the time to take care of the 18 different types of vegetables that are on your list. So when you look at that and it says $150, you're probably buying more than you can actually handle. And that's the <laughs> Astrid's point is you got to put it in the ground, right? So don't let it go 10 years the way my hollyhocks did. Um, one thing I'm going to do this year that's different is I'm going to be buying the, um, 
the seedlings like tomatoes and peppers that need bottom heat or just warm air, I'm gonna focus on other things. Um, and actually another shout out to Astrid, I'm, I'm gonna see what she has. Um, just to limit my my time, you, you end up doing triage in June because you have those 18 things. And guess what? Of those 18 things, you have all these seed cells and you planted like 15 of each. So multiply 15 by 18 and you have got a problem on your hands for sure. And I wanted to let you know if you find yourself in that situation that the Waldo County Bounty is going to be taking seedlings this year. It's um, in, around the county, they have assigned tables, like a take it or leave it type of thing. And one of the things that you can leave, leave or take is your seedling. So if you are like me and you ended up with 40 more broccoli plants than you really can use, rather than adding to the food waste problem, you can find out um, through Vina, our cooperative extension person, where the closest table is. Unless somebody knows. Barb, do you know if there's a table in Belfast this year? There's going to be, there's one oh. at the UU Church has one. We, oh, okay. we put out Corliss, cool. and Corliss was organizing that last year. Cool. Nice, and Vina has one of the extension offices if you go out is it Route 7 and you're just passing in front of you main extension? There's a table right at the road for dropping and taking. Oh, good to know. Yeah, we had one at the um, Brooks town, town office. Yeah, they're all over the place. All right, so share those extra seedlings. Um, the second thing we thought is when you get that seed, make sure you put it um, in the pot at the right time. And I want to ask you to um, explain to the group and me why the first year I grew zinnias for the first time, like three years ago, and they were amazing. And I, next year I ordered like 10 different kinds of zinnias and I had total crop failure. And when we were talking during this eight hours of prep time, um, she mentioned zinnias have to go at it like so can you just explain to everybody about Azinia? Because I will be sending people um, who send me their address a package of Zinnia seeds that I sa save. So can you speak to that a little bit, Astrid? Sure. So there's, and, and speaking, there are certain, if you see this, does not like to be transplanted, number one, when you're starting seeds. And does really wants to be warm start warm right right now like i wanted to start seeds in january of course that would have been a disaster i mean if i had a greenhouse it, 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 and it were big enough maybe it wouldn't have been a disaster but it could have been a disaster um because there are certain things and zinnias is one of them zinnias want to grow warm they're from mexico they you know they grow as weeds in Mexico. That's where they started. So they want it warm, warm, warm. They want the air warm, they want the soil warm. If you start a zinnia in the beginning of May and you don't put it out in the ground until the second week in June, which is probably when you should put it into the ground, that plant is going to be, it's gonna just sit there. It's gonna be very sad. Um, the reason why is uh, it doesn't really like to be pot bound for that long and it will grow, it will produce seed, but it may actually, its growth may be checked and it may produce seed quicker, it may bloom quicker and be really short and really stunted because it's an annual, right? Its whole reason to live is to produce seed. So it's really gonna try but you have checked its growth because you started it too early and left it in a too small a pot. And um, now the other thing that you could do is start it really early like that and get it in the ground too early when the ground is too cold, that will also check its growth. So something like a zinnia, you don't really need to start, it will sprout really quickly if it's got enough heat and you don't really need to start it till like maybe mid, even the third week in May, 
and then you put it out like this this end of the first or into the second week of June, just as a little tiny plant. And then you also want to pinch it back. Once it has two or three, maybe four sets of true leaves, you want to pinch it back to the either the first or second set of true leaves. You will get a much more robust and bigger, happier plant. And it won't have sat around in a little tiny pot for too long before you've done it. So that's, that's my recommendation for Zinnia. And there's, there's a lot of things that really don't need to be started too early. I mean, what, I, what I'm going to be doing is starting the cool weather annuals and uh, the cool weather annuals, which fall into two categories, flowery things and vegetable -y things, which are also flowery things, but we happen to eat the fruit, right? So I'm going to start those earlier because they can actually, if you harden them off, go out just when the ground can be worked and they can deal with a little cold weather and they can deal with even some frost and maybe I'll have a little um, frost cloth or something to cover them with if I need to, but they don't mind growing in colder soil. So those are the ones you concentrate on getting started first. And then you worry about your... You worry about your zinnias, your corn, your melons, your watermelon much later. Now, there are two, though, that because they are perennials and longer growing, even though they like heat, you want to get them started sooner. And that is tomatoes and peppers. So if you know that the plant is actually a perennial where it grows naturally, that gives you some information about the fact that because it's a perennial, it's less hellbent on blooming and um, making fruit, right? It takes longer for it to get to that stage of its life. So you need to start tomatoes and peppers sooner inside on heat because they are heat loving. And then you are going to want to bump them up into larger containers. You can actually, if you grow your peppers in nice big containers and you have a sunroom or a sunny warm spot in your house, you can bring them in the, in, in, in the winter prior to frost. And if you keep them in a sunny warm space and you fertilize them, you will continue to get peppers. They will continue to bloom and they will continue to fruit for you. And you can even save them through the winter as houseplants and put them back outside. So Ashley, we have a question in chat. Sharon Ooh. says, I live in Waldo. I had when I lived while I lived in Waldo, I had a lovely sunroom where I planted seeds every year for at least 10 years. Most of the seeds I planted sprouted and grew to a height of perhaps two inches, but then would not get any taller. I used a seed planting medium, but never used any fertilizer or anything. And I'm not sure what I did wrong. So this is one of our fertilizing, uh, right. fertilizing your plants and Ashley will talk about that. Yeah, so seed starting medium, which is great because it's really fine and it gives your little babies like the most beautiful little bed to get started in, has zero nutrition in it. So uh, it's, it's a very, um, it's, it's a good medium for, so a seed, is um, somebody who I keep forgetting to look up said that a seed is an embryo in a picnic basket, which is a really perfect way to describe a seed because it is a little, it is a, it's basically got its own uterus to grow in for a while, right? So as it's beginning, it has everything it needs in its little seed packet to get going. And those first little leaves, which are called cotyledon leaves are not even the true leaves of the plant, but those start first and they immediately start photosynthesizing and getting more nutrition into the, into the little package so it can lay down roots. But very quickly, it is going to want more nutrition than is in your typical seed starting mix. So what I do at that point is once I just see even the, the little barest inkling of true leaves, I know that that seed is ready to have more food. Um, and I use fish emulsion 
And I use it at, at that stage, usually a quarter strength. And I feed my seedlings once a week with a quarter strength of fish emulsion. Then as they get larger or I bump them up, I up pot them to a bigger size, I'll do half strength. And then at some point, you know, you can just, you know, be your, you know, once they're out in the garden, you can use fish emulsion full strength for at once a week or once every other week. It depends on what your soil is like. And it actually depends on what you're growing because um, certain things that are heavy feeders like tomatoes where, and peppers where we want that fruit, wa uh, melons, we want fruit. Those are heavy feeders because they need all that nutrition to make those big fruits. Um, other things like greens, it's less important it's like you don't, you don't need you don't need a lot of you don't need a lot of uh, nutrition a lot of extra nutrition for so, those. Ashley, products. when you talk about fish emulsion, um, there's nothing really called fish emulsion. When you walk into Obishan, you don't ask for fish emulsion, right? It's like nature's bounty or something. What is that called? That well, so you would ask for fish emulsion if you went into a place where they know what they're doing, and there may be someone at Obishan that knows what they're doing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Neptune's Harvest is the yeah, one that, that I one. use because it's organic. Yeah. Um, so uh, there are other fish emulsions you can get, absolutely. And there are other ways to fertilize plants. But I like that because it is not, it's not a high test fertilizer. It's not, um, I'm a low input nursery and I'm a low input grower. So I want to help my plants, but I also want to make nice, strong, sturdy plants that can get their nutrition from the ground, not from the fertilizer. So that jug is going to set you back about 50 bucks. But the thing is, um, Astrid is using it like at a quarter strength or half strength. So if it's set a tablespoon per gallon, you'll get more money bang for your buck if you just half that. That's just because they want to sell you more product. And it's not great to over well, There's a whole thing of right. problems that can happen to you with over fertilization. You can also buy it in a quart size container. Oh, which right, right. Yeah, yeah. People right. is plenty. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to uh, whip through. Sure. I'm going to send out the nine steps that we thought were um, rules to live by for seed sowing, but I just wanted to show one tip I learned just yesterday when I went to a Zoom on seed sowing. And that this comes from Ann Perkins. I've never seen this before, um, who is uh, the nursery person down in uh, Owl's Head, Headacre Farm. And so she has two containers. One has water and one has your seed. And she has this tool and she dips it in the water and then she picks up the very small columbine seed or whatever. This is going to help you with over sowing in that little um, pot that you have. And Astrid, I wanted to um, ask you, do you see how I put the depth? Like one is a quarter inch and one is a half inch. How important is depth when you're sowing a seed? Like that's not a huge difference. You know, it's like the margin for error there is huge. Is it really so, that important? Mary, actually for the seed sowing method that you are showing us, yeah. you do not need that depth on your little stick at all because any seed that is that size should be sown on the surface of your potting soil. It should right. not be buried at all. And mm -hmm. unless it says on the packet needs darkness to germinate, which some seeds do, then you don't even want to cover it with anything. But the trick is then you need to keep it moist. You need to keep the area humid and you need to keep the top of that soil damp. And the way that I do that, there's a couple ways you can do it at home. You can actually get these little plastic roofs that go over your 10, 20 trays. And that helps keep a humid environment. I have a spray bottle that I use to dampen the soil on top until my seeds germinate. Once they germinate, they're really good at getting that root down quick. And actually you want them to get the root down quick and you don't wanna mess around with making them too damp at the top because you'll get mold, you'll get fungus gnats, you'll get a bunch of stuff. Um, 
but before before they germinate they want to be in a consistently moist environment but they also those little tiny seeds need to really be on the surface and get get light for the most part right that's a good point i something else i was thinking so one of the tricks i'm going to be um doing this year is cutting my milk jug so i have two sizes here astrid i want to avoid potting up and i was wondering if i'm going to start four broccoli seeds why don't i just avoid potting up and start in this one is it all about the moisture yeah so i would say that um there are pluses and minuses um doing what you are suggesting if you if you are an over waterer if you're an enthusiastic waterer then starting your baby plants in that big size there's a danger that once they germinate you will overwater them and your soil will just be too soggy and never dry out. And actually what you want is a kind of um, seeds, uh, plants need moisture, yes, and they need nutrition, but they also need oxygen. So if you have a, if you have a heavy, if, if you water too much, then you are preventing oxygen from getting into the soil, which is why you want a kind of it almost dries out too much and then you water. It almost dries out too much and then you water. You get a much stronger seedling. It's much happier. So if you are an underwaterer, then, um, which most people are not, by the way, um, then the big size works. Uh, another way though, to prevent yourself from being an overwaterer is to water from the bottom. So if you have that, larger plastic container and it's got holes in the bottom and you set it in a tray that doesn't have holes in it and you pour water in and you let just the the plant soak you let the soil soak the water up from the bottom into the it through capillary action it will water will be brought up all the way to the top of the plant so that can kind of help if you're an overwaterer if that makes sense so we had a question about lettuce. Is that um, something that needs light to germinate or you can just do that on the top? And I feel like when I spray the water, it's just gonna bury itself anyway. So can I just go like that and put it on top? Go, the, go uh, like what? Planting the lettuce seed. Yeah, so the answer is I don't know if lettuce needs dark to germinate and I would need to look it up. and. That is, uh, I, one thing that I would say right now is uh, I find the internet to be my friend and uh, I'm constantly researching. And because I grow hundreds, if probably thousands of different kinds of plants, I can't remember everything. So I am constantly looking things up and reminding myself of what needs what, when. Um, so what I would do is look that up and then I would have an answer. And all you have to do is type lettuce into a search engine and you will- Starting get lettuce from seed, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, another question is if one wants to start seeds inside um, the house next to a window, when do we start? April, May, earlier? And I'm gonna know, you're gonna say it depends. <laughs> Right. Yes, it depends. It depends. It depends. But again, what we want to know is what is our last frost date? Right? What's our average last frost date? Is it May 30th? And then we work. Well, some people are going to tell you it's May 15th. Some people are going to tell you it's May 31st. Some people are going to tell you it is after the last full moon in May whenever that is. And sometimes it's not till early June. That full moon is actually not at the end of May, it's early June. And then it's safe to plant out after that. Right, but if you're starting them in the house so that you have your flowers going along nicely before that period, what month do we start them around here? It, de it depends. So um, it's gonna say something on the packet like, four to six weeks before your last frost date, right? Or that, that's for indoors. 
Okay. That's for indoors. That yes. isn't for outdoors. Yep, 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 yep. Right. And it'll say, yep. it'll say things like, sometimes it'll say you can direct sow this two weeks before your last frost date for like cold weather plants. There are some that you can just actually put in the ground a couple weeks before your last frost date and you're fine. And that if you, if you don't have a lot of room in the house, right, there's a, it's really good to figure out what you don't need to start in the house. And even for right. me, because I rent greenhouse space and I have limited greenhouse space, I have a whole list of plants that, that I am going to start through the winter sowing method, which Mary touched upon. Um, and that is a way you're actually making little mini greenhouses out of soda bottles or milk jugs. And you're putting them outside about four to six weeks before your last frost date, but you're putting them outdoors. And what you get by doing this is a couple of things. One is you have this nice little environment that stays kind of the right moisture without having to run around so much and watering and worrying about it. Plus, when the plant, when the seeds germinate, they germinate exactly when they want to, but because you've got them in a controlled environment, you can see it. Like when you direct sow, there's a, there's a, a lot of ways, this is why seeds, this is why plants make so many seeds because there's a lot of ways for this process to fail. Um, so if you, if you do some winter sowing, what you get is a couple of things. You get a controlled environment, but it's not an environment that you have to mess around with a lot. It's out there and you just have to check on them. And, and when they start germinating, then you gotta pay a little bit more attention to them. They're automatically hardened off which is so great, right? You don't have to go like dragging trays in and out of places to get them used to being outdoors. I mean, you do have to maybe get, start taking the top off at some point and getting them used to wind, air movement. And you, but you're gonna wanna do that anyway, as it gets warmer, you're gonna wanna give them a little bit more of uh, real air and not the rarefied air of inside the milk jug. Then you can put them in the ground. And then you've started all your plants that need heat, that need more heat indoors. So Mary is showing you what she's doing. And you can actually just cut around three sides and leave a little hinge too, if you want. So you still have to transplant this. So when you say direct sow outside, it's not, or you could do it just in your bed, but we want to coddle it a little bit. So a compromise is to start here and then take it out and let it have at it and then transplant it when it's time. Yeah. And so for me, because I am selling seedlings, this is a good way for me to do it. Right. And then I, I'm like, okay, there's my 20 Papaveroia seeds. They're they're looking bonkers gorgeous and they just got their first cotyledon leaves. And then I'm going to up pot them into little adorable containers and put them in a tray and they're good to go. And as, and I'll mark them and I'll be ready to take them to market and sell them to people once they've, you know, settled in. So, but for, for gardeners, right, there's a lot of advantages because you might want to, for example, right now we could all run outside and throw poppy seeds on the snow. And it's super fun to do. If you've got a lot of poppy seeds, go do it. I highly recommend it. But it's, it's a crapshoot. You don't quite know where the seeds are going to come up. You don't quite know how many of them are going to come up. It's kind of fun. But if you would like to be deciding where you're going to put your delphinium or your feverfew or your foxglove or your larkspur, a way to start those cold, cold season uh, annuals and perennials is to start them winter sowing outdoors and then put them in the ground. Can you just repeat that list of what we can do? Larkspur, Delphinium, Oh, here, here's a list. Here's what I am gonna try winter sowing. Now, a few of these things, I'm probably also gonna start indoors as well, but don't worry about that. That's just for my purposes of being a commercial nursery. Amy Magus, Bachelor Buttons, Bells of Ireland, Black-Eyed Susan, Bupleurum, Calendula, Canterbury Bells. I'm actually not growing that, but that is one thing that you can cold sow. Um, corn cockle, which is agrostemma, Delphinium, 
fever fume, foxglove, which is a biennial, uh, larkspur, lunaria, nigella, although for your purposes, direct sowing nigella might be better because it is really fussy about getting up potted. That's love in a mist is the common name. Um, pansies, but I'm also starting pansies inside because they are, some of these things that are perennial, I'm also starting inside mostly because I want a plant this year that's actually retail ready to sell to somebody. Um, they'll start just fine outdoors, but they won't grow as quickly and I want them to grow faster. So I'm starting them in a greenhouse. Um, poppies, uh, scabiosa, snapdragons, sweet peas, although again, they will grow faster for you if you start them on heat, but they do then like to grow on cool. So things that will germinate that want heat to germinate often prefer cooler conditions to grow on than you have in your house or in, in even in a greenhouse. So these are likely candidates for winter sowing. It just means they're going to germinate kind of on a different schedule than they will if you start them in your house. Um, Sweet William, verbascum, yarrow, wallflower, those are, all, those are all likely candidates of flowers to start with the winter sowing method. Now, as far as, as, far as um, veggies, peas, definite. And a good reason to start those in a little bit more of a protected environment is they are mouse candy. And then when they sprout, they're rabbit candy. <laughs> so if you start them in a little bit more of a protected spot, you might have uh, better luck. Uh, same with, um, well, you've got your brassicas. Any of your brassicas can be winter sown to good effect. And that would be, oh my gosh, uh, kales, broccolis, mustards, um, any, anything in that family, cauliflower, um, all that stuff. Dandelion greens, you know, if you're, Almost any green uh, responds fine to winter sowing because you're not worried about the flowers, even if they do flower at some point. You're, you have harvested them before that time, unless of course you want to save the seed. So one of the um, nurseries on your seed list is Aaron Parker down um, Edgewood. He yeah. gave me pink dandelion seeds that when you are starting your own seed, the last thing you're going to start is a dandelion, but knowing that it can go out, then that's a way for me not to feel guilty that he gave me something that I never actually did. So in the remaining time, and please drop off if you have to, do people yeah. have specific questions that they want to ask, ask on and on. really the guru? Is there something that um, you wanted to find out by coming to the Zoom that we didn't cover? I'd like the name of Nikki's, the book that Nikki wrote. What is the name of the book again and her last name? Her last name is Jabour, J-A-B-B-O-U-R. And it's N-I-K-I -I is her first name. And it's Veggie Garden Remix. Thank you. Sure. So Pat, that should be on the club website under book donations um, eventually. Um, so the list of um, the 2020 donations should be up and we're just doing some web reconfiguring. It was there, but it'll be back. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, I'm not gonna keep you. I think um, we- One thing I'll say is- Oops. It's also in your directory, Pat. If we this year's book donations are listed in the directory. That's right. Thanks yeah. for reminding us of that, Barb. Yeah. Right. Um, if anyone is nervous about starting seeds, like I don't know the experience level. I assume so, I assume a lot of people here have started seeds, but if you haven't, there are some great resources. For example, and some of these are in the resource packet. Like I did. Um, 
in the seed house area, there's a little bit more resources after that that are kind of related to seed starting. And on Facebook, there is a great page for winter sowing. Um, and there's also a great website for winter sowing. And these people are bonkers enthusiastic. You can ask any question you want or search their Facebook page and, and go on YouTube. There's a, there's a million YouTubes. There's a lot of information about winter sowing. And then also the wonderful Joe Lample, who is Joe Gardner, has a great website and also Facebook page. And he, again, is very generous. That group is very generous and excited about getting people growing. And there's a lot of sharing that goes on. And so if, if you need, if you feel like you need some emotional support and technical support as a beginning seed grower, those two places are great. All right. Well, I think that about wraps it up. Thanks, everyone. And as I said, I'll be sending you um, a bunch of information. One of the fun things is how to make paper pots out of your Fedco catalog using origami techniques. It's a square <laughs> pot. I love that. I love square pots, round, but not so much. So um, probably in the next two days, you'll find that in your inbox. But we should Thank take you. the direction, everyone. Well, right. Use what? Last, use last Fedco year. Fedco always has the great descriptions of the plants, you know, the starting seeds and all the things you were going over. We should tear those out before we start making I hate that the pots. Good point. <laughs> well, I mean, it's true, right? The Fedco catalog mm -hmm. and the Johnny's catalog mm -hmm. are filled, just filled with information. And the Johnny's website has a lot of really excellent growing information on it. Uh, Fedco, not so much, but the Fedco catalog, of course, is the Bible and everyone should be reading that from cover to cover. Anyone who eats should read that catalog. Yeah. But of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I mean, this is what I do all the time, learn about this stuff and research it and practice. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has them. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank Happy you. Bye. Hopefully, I'll see you next month. Oh, right. So next month, we're doing echo restoration, which is, can you just give a quick, oh, I had a definition, but can you just explain what next month is, Astrid? Next month is about planting more plants in the ground and sequestering carbon. And uh, talking about why we call some plants weeds, for example, that's such an interesting conversation, and how we can, as people with small backyards, small front yards, pots of plants by the, by the front step, or even larger spaces, how we can be um, beautiful ornamental gardeners and also very, very good ecological services providers. Good, good synopsis. All right, everyone, take care and okay. see you in March. Bye. Thanks for hosting these. Bye.